We will now hear about uh, radio observations and the first talk will be by Rob Sender from University of Oxford about radio observing. Thank you very much. Yes, um, so I've been asked, it's nice to be here by the way. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Rob Fender from Oxford and um, I'm going to be here until the end of the meeting tomorrow. So I think I'm probably one of the few radio astronomers here. I know there's a couple of others in the room. So if you have any questions about anything that, I, that come up in my talk, I should be around until the end of tomorrow for you to ask. So um, I was asked to give an overview of what's going on right now in the area of searching for and following up uh, astrophysical transients with radio telescopes and also to give some thoughts on prospects for the future. So what I'm going to do is I'll give a brief overview. I'll talk a little bit about work that's being done by my own group and then I'll try and give um, a more general picture of where I see things going in the next decade. Okay. Right, so just a, a very brief introduction then on the transient radio universe. So there are two types of radio transient um, in a nutshell. There are synchrotron transients which are incoherent emission and there are coherent transients. So the synchrotron transients, which are the ones that I'm describing on, uh, on this uh, slide, are essentially associated with, uh, with uh, particle acceleration and kinetic feedback from essentially every energetic explosion in the universe, right? So the, the, the sound speed of the interstellar medium is somewhere between 10 and uh, 1,000 uh, uh, kilometers per second, and these transients, they come off somewhere between 10,000 uh, kilometers per second um, and essentially the speed of light when it comes to jets black holes. So you always get shocks when these, this material um, is fired away from these energetic events. And as far as we know, pretty much every energetic event produces therefore a shock wave, which results in the particle acceleration. Um, the, one, uh, the one notable exception and something that we've been trying very hard to remedy in recent years, along with other groups and have, and have not yet succeeded, is trying to find synchrotron articles from type 1a supernovae, but they must be out there at some level. It's probably just because they've got relatively low density environments around them that's not allowing us to, to see strong signals. Um, there's lots of reasons that you want to observe the radio counterparts to these transients. So one of the primary ones and one of my main goals when I'm studying them myself is because you can use the, the radio mission to get a good measure of the kinetic feedback from these events. So, so for your typical astrophysical transient, there'll be some very strong and often quite prompt uh, uh, optical or infrared or x-ray emission, which tells you about the instantaneous release of energy. But there's also a load of material fired away, which is, compared to the initial transient event, it's typically uh, invisible. And it's only when we see it shocking and interacting with the medium afterwards, we realize that actually a lot of uh, the liberated energy, sometimes the majority of the liberated energy, was actually in this sort of hitherto unseen outflow, which uh, reveals itself to its super afterwards. And one of the nice things about radio telescopes is that we get very wide fields of view with the new generation facilities because they tend to be comprised of very large numbers of very small dishes, but also because they're interferometers we have very high uh, 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 angular resolution, which is of course something you can't uh, do with single dishes, which is uh, you know, difficult MO, for example, for optical astronomy. However, if you look at broad band uh, emission from most classes of transients, you will still find that they are easier in general to pick up optical or, or x-ray wavelengths and again this is what you'll probably see i would predict in the next decade for uh, neutron star merger events uh, things like 170817 um, where there will be a higher rate of detection of optical and x-ray wavelengths than there will at radio until at least until we get the square kilometer array um, the other type of radio transient are coherent transients for example fast radio bursts um, and essentially various flavors of things that seem to be largely associated with neutron stars. The underlying physics of these things is unclear. Sometimes you get some kind of maser emission. Sometimes uh, there are packets of electrons moving together, um, but essentially they can have very, very high brightness temperatures, much higher brightness temperatures than you get from incoherent synchrotron emission. Um, and because of this, you can see things to very, very large distances. And because the bursts have such high brightness temperatures, they can be very narrow, which means you can actually use, for example, the dispersion of a fast radio burst to tell you something about the intervening gas over many, many gigaparsecs, very, very large distances indeed. I'm not going to spend multi wavelength data on these, are very, very sparse indeed compared to super strong transients. Large numbers are being found right now. I'm not going to say anything more about fast radio bursts because the next talk online from Ben Stappers uh, will be focusing on those. So if you look at the um, parameter space for radio transients, one way of looking at it, 
at it is like this. So essentially, this is time scale here. Okay, so think of this as time scale in terms of seconds. So here's one second over here's several years and down here is something like the quantum limit and up here on the, the y axis, this is luminosity. You may also look at the y axis since we spread over such a large range of different classes of objects and luminosities as a kind of distance indicator. So some of the nearest objects on this plot, for example, Jupiter, that's pretty near, um, and most of the flare stars we've, we've observed, and the most distant objects um, are qu uh, quasars, blazars, and some of the dark radio bursts. Um, if you assume that the variability time scale tells you about the size of the emitting region, then you can draw diagonal lines on these figures, which are at fixed brightness temperature, and then you can see that we have a region down here that's shaded in blue, which is consistent with being less than or equal to a brightness temperature of 10 to the 12 Kelvin. So that's, just, that's consistent with incoherent synchrotron emission and everything over here in the white patch should be coherent bursts. So most of what I'm talking today about are these, these, uh, the explosive events which tend to have the, the synchrotron emission. There are a few up here, just above the top of the blue line, which are uh, incoherent synchrotron emission, but appear to have higher brightness temperatures, and that's simply because they're beamed towards us. Okay, so Doppler beaming makes them look like they've got uh, higher brightness temperatures. Okay, um, and yeah, and then the, the final point to note is that these transients, the synchrotron transients, are typically observed uh, in images, and that's what I'll be showing you a few of in a moment. And transients over on this side are typically uh, detected in uh, beamform data. That is just essentially uh, 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 time uh, streams of the data. Okay, so what I'd like to tell you about for a moment um, is a little bit about what I think is almost the cutting edge, or certainly from a very biased, a very biased viewpoint, the cutting edge of image plane transient follow-up and surveys at the moment in the radio band. And that's the project which I'm lucky enough to, to co-lead on the Meerkat radio telescope. We call our project Thundercat. I can't really remember why, um, but anyway, it sounded good at the time when we proposed it a long time ago. Um, and this project was awarded five years of guaranteed time on Meerkat. We just finished the fourth of those five years, but we're hopeful that it's going to extend onto the future, at least until Meerkat becomes part of the SKA. So um, we observe a number of different source classes. Um, we observe X-ray binary systems, which are shown in this schematic here, but we're also allowed to uh, observe short GRBs and type 1A supernovae. And because we're allowed to observe short GRBs, that means that if there is gravitational wave event in the coming year or so that is detected to be uh, associated with a short GRB will be able to use Meerkat to, to follow that up. The objects which I'm uh, in my own group study uh, largely but not exclusively these X-ray binaries where essentially you have a neutron star or a black hole accreting at the center of an accretion flow just like in an active galactic nucleus but of course it's all scaled down. The binary star essentially over here is just an orbiting fuel tank. The physical processes are very much the same. You have a highly relativistic flow, you have very hot uh, plasma uh, near probably a rotating black hole there at the center. So for a long time, um, there was a movie which showed how variable the sky was in X-rays, and we weren't able to do this at other wavelengths. We're now able to do this in the radio band. So this is a galactic projection, and all of these points are, this is weekly uh, radio monitoring of the high energy sky with the Meerkat radio telescope over the last three and a half years. Every single one of these objects you see is a neutron star or a black hole within our own galaxy. The size of the point tells you about how bright it was uh, uh, in uh, 1.4 gigahertz, the Meerkat band, the weekend when we observed it. And you see a, a, a range of activity going on. Now, every time you're seeing a bright radio source here, this means that there's been a large population of relativistic electrons accelerated. If we threw in monitoring of the northern hemisphere sources as well, then you essentially, in the absence of a supernova in our galaxy, you have a real-time census of high energy particle acceleration, or at least of electron acceleration within our galaxy, pretty much uh, at any given moment. So this is very exciting, it's very nice that we're able to do this finally. Um, However, there was a big surprise, which is that we, we, you know, we've been observing these things in radio for a long time. Uh, normally, when you observe these things in radio, you see the jets for a couple of weeks and you don't see them anymore and they disappear away. What we found with Meerkat, because we had this long-term program of monitoring um, with a very sensitive radio telescope, is in fact that we, have, we understand a lot more about the jets from these objects now. So this is the final image from that previous movie. Um, and everything you see with a box around it actually are sources where we managed to track Essentially, all the, all the, 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 from the moment of launch, where we saw fluctuations in the accretion flow and x-rays, 
all the way through to their final deceleration in the interstellar medium when they've given up all their kinetic energy. A few of these sources were known before, so the, the cyan boxes here, these were known to be large-scale jet sources, and there are five new ones there, and there's another one which we've discovered since I made the slides, so it's not on here. So we're now discovering at a rate of about one to two per year, new sources where we can track the deceleration of a jet from launch, from a black hole, from the moment of launch, all the way through to its deceleration, and that allows us to do almost perfect precision calorimetry in principle, at least, of that jet. And that's something you simply can't do with jets from any other uh, black hole or black hole-related objects. Um, I don't have time to go through all of these objects. This is just one of them. These are observations of a black hole called Maxi J1820, which was discovered in uh, about three years ago. Um, and these are observations that show that at a very late time, so you can see here, we're at half a year after outbursts, we're still tracking the jets. And with this source and with all the other ones, at a certain point, you saw the proper motions away from the core started to slow down. You saw the blobs brighten as they finally decelerate and give up all of their, what's left of their initial kinetic energy. These blobs, were, uh, these jets were also observed to be moving away um, and strongly detected uh, in X-rays with Chandra. So we have a continuous optically thin synchrotron spectrum all the way from the radio band through the X-ray band. So you'll recall this, of course, has been done historically multiple times for AGM, but it was also done, for example, with 170817, uh, 17, the neutral star merger event. And it tells you all sorts of things about the electron spectrum, the absence of breaks, etc. The most basic thing it tells you um, is that you are clearly, we're observing real-time acceleration of electrons to at least TV energies. It doesn't tell you a thing directly about the hadrons, but of course, you know, you might want to, to infer something from that as well. Um, as I say, we see the jets decelerating, we can really accurately measure the launch time. We can measure the launch time down to, to about an hour, right? So we know exactly what the accretion flow is doing at the time of launch, and we see it all the way through deceleration. Sometimes we get lucky and we can measure the physical size of the ejector, which is a key thing, and we can get the energy estimates. So we know that 90 days after ejection, so that's around the top of this plot here, and we have simultaneous observations at a range of different uh, angular resolutions, and still then, 90 days, when it should have decelerated a lot, it still was carrying 10 to the 42 odds of energy, which is a really large amount. Um, okay, so um, I don't have time to, to tell you more about that, but that's a really exciting, ongoing part of the project. We're seeing more and more of these large-scale jets that's really offering the, the, the opportunity to do very precision calorimetry. Going in a very different direction, however, one of the other things we have with Meerkat is we have, you know, we have this enormous field of view. So Meerkat makes really nice images um, out to about one degree from the pointing center because we have these relatively small dishes. And typically we're just targeting one of our objects, which is essentially the central pixel of that beautiful uh, one degree field. But we make, uh, we, we observe the same field again and again and again weekly to track the central object. So then we get stacks of images and we can search these stacks of images to see if there's any serendipitous field transients in them, um, in the radio band. And of course, again, this is something that people do optical wavelengths and x-ray wavelengths for, for a long time. And it's something we've hoped to do in radio, um, but, but weren't previously able to. Um, now we can, we're now at the, the time where we're beginning to see uh, uh, large, large numbers of bona fide radio transients. Okay, so we launched uh, on, in December last year, so about nine, uh, nine months ago now, we launched a Zooniverse project called Bursts from Space Meerkat. This was following on from Bursts from Space, which is the first Zooniverse project for radio transients, which is a project for FRBs. Um, this is just an illustration of, uh, of a Meerkat field. So we think they're very, very wide fields. Of this is a uh, this is a, a one square degree uh, uh, region of the center of one of these fields. So we get these stacks of images. We set up the Zooniverse project led by my student Alex Anderson, but with a lot of help from others. And um, he set up this project where he found he had something like 9,000 potential transient candidates. He put them on a, a citizen science platform. Each citizen scientist was provided with a typical image and with a light curve of it. The object and was asked to classify it along a number of things. They were given a tutorial, is it extended? If it's extended, probably the light curve is not trustworthy and probably it's not a um, bona fide transient. Does the light curve really look like a transient, etc.? Um, so there are, and each object, uh, each uh, potential transient was classified 10 times. So we have huge numbers um, of classifications. I think uh, the total number may be on here. So we have 
Yeah, we have 89,000 source classifications given by over 1,000 volunteers. Um, and we're about to launch the second data release of this project. So in a nutshell, we had this rather poor way of trying to find the interesting transients ourselves, which is that we would process the light curves of these transients. We have two parameters. This one here is essentially pi squared, and this one here is essentially amplitude. And you'd hope that interesting variables would be towards the top right hand corner. What we found, what the system scientists found, is that there's a whole bunch of interesting transients, for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure yet, are actually buried in this cloud of points here that you would assume are actually not very interesting sources. So the citizen scientists have found about 160 new uh, variable candidates, which when poor old Alex has gone off and eyeballed all of the light curves actually look like new bona fide radio transients. So here's a, here's a couple of examples. Here's a source that we haven't picked up ourselves, and this clearly looks like a radio transient. Don't know what it is. Um, and here's another one. Um, uh, light curve, single bright point, don't know what it is, but if you look at the images, I mean, that does look like decent images. That really looks like some bright radio source turns on. So we're just at the beginning of this, uh, this kind of journey into, uh, into to trying to follow up these, uh, these radio transients. All right, um, very high energy gamma ray bursts. Um, this is something which I know is a lot of interest to people in the room, and of course we just heard uh, 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 a couple of talks about this. Um, the work in Oxford on this is led by Lauren Rhodes, who just finished her PhD uh, with me at Oxford, has just started a postdoc. So um, we were lucky enough, well we have been lucky enough, or we, we, Lauren has been very dedicated in writing DPT proposals, um, and we've got lots of radio data on all of these uh, very high energy GRVs. Um, I just want to show you a couple of examples and show you the conclusions that we've drawn today. So the first thing is that all of the VHE GRVs have been detected in the radio band. There are long-standing models um, developed in the GRV community for the physics of these afterglows. Um, essentially, uh, high, highly relativistic shocks, shocks propagating into the interstellar medium, jet breaks, etc. And it's a well-established literature. And it turns out that some of the data we have for these very high-energy GRVs the synchronous afterglows are some of the best data that we have for any GRVs at all. So this is one of the first ones that Lauren studied, so GRV 1908-29A. Um, and in this case, we got good coverage with Meerkat, which are the blue points here, um, and also with Amy, uh, which is a telescope in the UK, which we're fortunate enough to have a lot of And we see that actually, at a relatively late time, there was a peak at the lower frequency, but um, the, the source of monotonically uh, declining at the higher frequency, and then in fact, in fact, flattened because we were detecting the host galaxy at late time. This is actually one of the best radio light curves for, for any GRV. Um, and essentially, the interpretation is that there was a reverse shock um, at early times at high frequencies, and then later on, the, uh, the emission was the more traditional forward shock, um, uh, uh, usually invoked to explain the synchrotron emission from these things. Um, a more recent one, uh, 2012-16C, this is, this is not a great plot, uh, Lauren tried hard to find a good way of plotting uh, X-ray optical and radio data that, that, that showed it all very nicely, but essentially there's a complicated set of behaviour in uh, the synchrotron afterglow for this source that is hard to explain in any of the standard models. This one is also very interesting because it's a very high energy GRB, but it's a dark GRB, which means it's a lot, it's optically faint compared to what you would expect for the, the normal population of, uh, of GRBs. The best interpretation that Lauren's been able to come up with is actually that there are two different forward shocks uh, in this source. So there's a forward shock associated with a narrow collimated uh, jet. The forward shock, by the way, is just when you have the relative ejector, they hit the interstellar medium and their jet and shock front propagates outwards accelerating electrons behind it. But there's also, um, in, in uh, her interpretation, there's also a second forward shot, which is at a wider angle. And interestingly, similar models, um, although a little bit more involved, were invoked to explain the multi-wavelength multi behavior of 1708-17, which is the neutron star merger event. All right. Um, so one of the first questions that we wanted to ask when we had this uh, compilation of synchrotron afterglows for these very high energy GRBs is, are they different to the other GRBs? It's the obvious question to ask. So what you see here is uh, the redshift corrected time and uh, radio luminosity for the synchrotron afterglows 
of all the VHEGLBs, GLBs, so those are the points in blue, and then a, a, a redshift controlled sample of normal GLBs, that is non VHE detected GLBs. And we've tapped these um, at a redshift so that the, the redshift range overlaps with the redshift range in VHE GLBs, which is constrained by the, the, the gamma ray cutoff. What you see first of all is that the first one I showed you, GLB 1909A, has this beautiful light curve and really is very, very good synchrotron light curve for one of these GRBs. But secondly, if you look at the overall population of these events, and you do, you know, you can tell by eye, but if you do the form of statistics, you can also see that there appears to be no difference between this population um, and the, the normal GRBs. So the initial um, uh, uh, conclusion after five sources is that uh, the synchrotron afterglows or the jets from the VHE GLBs are very similar, if not the same, as the jets from the, the field population of GLBs. All right, so let me finish then with uh, a word on future prospects. Um, first off, this is, uh, this is the beautiful Meerkat array from which a lot of the data I've been showing you comes in South Africa. Over the next five years or so, um, this will segue into SKA1 mid. So this is the, first, the mid frequency component of the first phase of the square kilometer array. So at the moment, we have 64 dishes, and uh, SKA1 mid will have around 200 dishes. This is something like a tripling or a bit more than that because the dishes are a bigger um, of the, the sensitivity and also significantly longer baselines. So essentially, this is a kind of super meerkat which will be more sensitive and have better angular resolution. In parallel, the next generation VLA project in North America, so the USA is not part of the SKA, is really gathering steam. Um, it seems to be well supported in the latest USK cable review, and they'll start constructing on a very similar time scale. So I think that there'll be full, my, my, my guess would be that there'll be full SKA operations in the south and NGVL operations in the, in the north by, um, by the start of, uh, of the next decade. However, um, uh, the SKA or, or NGVLA will be the main facility for, for following up and for searching for transients um, in the next decade. But you really don't need the kind of nano Jansky sensitivity that these, these things are going to have to follow up all the objects that we've been interested in talking about today, like the VHE GRBs and the neutrino target disruption events, because these things are at one or even 100 milli Janskys, and they're just, you know, they're, they're, you're going to be getting thousand signal detections uh, very, very quickly on these things. So my worry is that actually um, it might be hard to get time to get high cadence observations of these of these objects when you have a super powerful facility in the future. Now, of course, optical astronomy faced this issue a decade or so ago and got over it essentially by saying, well, we'll have big telescopes, but we'll have small ones as well to do the monitoring. This is not fashionable for radio astronomy because you can do in principle both with the same array, right? You have the small dishes, perhaps you could have a subset of them doing monitoring while most of them um, are doing the, the deep imaging. My concern is that while this is technically possible, this might not happen. And I would just like to suggest that you move, you know, we might want to consider having a small transient array in the south um, and perhaps a new one in the north as well. So this is, this is the Amy radio telescope in Cambridge in the UK. This is a very old telescope, but it's one that we installed the, the radio astronomy's first robotic rapid response system about 10 years ago now, so we automatically follow up on Swift GRBs. We've done a huge amount of work with this. So this is an old, cheap-ish telescope, very well built, um, rapid response system. So we have stellar mass black holes. We have 2019 DSG in neutrino TDE. This was, this was monitored and detected with Amy. We have thermal TDEs, we have VHG GRBs. We have an extraordinary supernova, which is still going on, 2014C. We have jets from white dwarfs. All of this from a very, very modest array. And my, what you see is that you get a lot of the science out of these objects by having the high cadence, by being able to monitor them daily or when they're evolving slowly, weekly. And my concern is that the SKA, it will be difficult for the SKA to fit in this kind of scheduling. So I think that the community really needs to think about whether or not it also needs dedicated transient monitoring arrays. Um, I would think my time is probably up. So. Um, in summary then, um, radio transients, it's, uh, it's very exciting um, and uh, it's really taking off both the follow-up of things down to other wavelengths um, uh, and in particular, you know, with all the kinds of extreme objects that, that many of you in the room are interested in, the, the high energy gamma ray, the neutrino objects and of course the gravitational wave objects. 
Uh, Meerkat, so I'm unbiased, as you know, but Meerkat is delivering amazing science. We have really, really amazing data on some of these high energy transients, but we're also getting all these field uh, uh, serendipitous transients, and we really don't know yet what's going to be in all that harvest of objects. I think the future is very, very bright for synergy between radio and other uh, high energy facilities, including neutrinos, CTA, etc. But I do have a nagging concern, as I've just expressed, that the, C that the SKA, maybe also the NGVLA will not actually be the facility to deliver these high cadence light curves, and we might need an alternative. Thank you very much for listening.